Welcome to Saturday Story Circle, always on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated G for general audience. Chapter 4 Nepal, 1928 The wind that swept across the jagged hills was bitterly cold, but to the ragged young man who approached the Kuti, it seemed like a blessing. He had just crossed the Annapurna Ridge, one of the highest and most foreboding places on earth to reach this spot, nestled as it was in the bosom of a tiny valley. He tried very hard not to think about the fact that he would have to cross it again to get out. He pulled the thin air deep into his lungs as he gazed at the mountain tops around him. He had been told that Annapurna meant goddess of the harvests. He could only imagine they had been named by those who dwelt far below, to whom the spring thaw would bring precious new life, not by those that eked out such an existence as was possible in this desolation. And yet still it seemed to him to be the most beautiful place that ever was or ever could be. The young man who stumbled on towards the mud hut was, like most who walked this path, on a great quest. Unlike most, this valley was not the end of that quest, but merely a step upon a long journey. He was tall and taut, muscular and lean. Few that had been born into the life of leisure and privilege to which he had could ever have summoned the will to cross that mountain pass. For a man is shaped by the forces around him. Those born into great wealth are rarely gifted with the drive to do more than spend that wealth on their own luxury or vanity. Those whom fate has shielded from all fear or pain are seldom able to see it in others. But as is so often the case, when an exception rears its head, it cannot help but run to the opposite extreme. August Fenwick's quest came from a burning need for justice, justice for those who could never know the comfort or security that he had always enjoyed, protection for those who could not protect themselves, and redemption for the Fenwick bloodline, whom he had judged to be guilty of a long history of wrongs in the name of the great god Money. But where to begin? He could, living in the much-observed life of a wealthy family's only son, study only so much before those around him took note. Inventing and criminology were not normal pursuits for a man of his status. He had been told so in no uncertain terms. And so he did what any brash young fool might do in his circumstances. He ran away with the circus. His parents had thought he was on the typical dissolute gadabouts tour of Europe, when in reality he had adopted a disguise and was himself adopted by a family of traveling acrobats. He had proved to be a star pupil as he absorbed their techniques, their fearlessness, their discipline. To the thrill of the crowds he soared high above where most men would dare to be, and in time learned to love the taste of fear. From time to time he would leave the circus as they traveled to a city where a great expert lived, a detective, a martial arts master, anyone whose skills he would need in the life's work he was creating for himself. Then, by deceit, by imploring, or by outright bribery, he would study under them for as long as seemed valuable, always disguised, always under a new identity. In time, word had reached him that his father was commanding him home, and he left the circus for good. The elder Fenwick had expected his only son to be ready to assume a mantle of respectability, to carry on the family name with dignity. After all, my son, I won't live forever, he had said, with the smile of a man who does not really believe that in his heart. It had taken a great deal of persuasion in order to be loosed upon the world again. After all, his father yet held the purse strings, and the next phase of his mission would be an expensive one. But soon enough he had departed for the Orient. The need for papers and passports made it more difficult to hide his identity, but a smile and a bribe can do wonders, if the bribe is large enough. In Japan, in China, and throughout the subcontinent, young August studied under the greatest masters in the many arts of combat. He learned of ancient devices and techniques, and learned to adapt them with his considerable mechanical skill. He knew that in order to succeed in his mission, even for a time, he must be able to do more than seemed possible for any mortal man. But as he traveled, he heard of even greater powers, long lost to the modern world, which were still practiced by a handful of faithful disciples. His travels brought him through India, where he absorbed many secrets, but always the true power that would aid him in his fight for justice seemed just out of reach. 
At last he had heard of a teacher, a sadhu, in the high steps of Nepal that had knowledge such as that he sought, a holy man who seemed to know the innermost workings of the mind as no man ever had. He was in every other respect prepared in mind and body. He considered himself ready to take the final step, ready to return to the city that had been his home and would become his battleground, to fight and in all probability to die for what he believed. Fenwick had sent a final cable back to Toronto through one of his father's companies, informing those at home of his intention to see the high country before returning at last, and set off the next day without waiting for a reply. It had taken longer than he had thought to reach this far, and as a small, wiry man with a long black robe wrapped around him like a tunic came to the door of the Kuti, he hoped that it was only the beginning. Greetings, he said in a halting mutilation of the local dialect. I am one who comes to you in order of you finding of that which he hides, darkness which rides far before him. You were doing all right for a moment there, said the sadhu in perfect English, but you lost me somewhere around the riding darkness. Actually, everything after greetings was kind of a mess. The young man stared at the mystic, blinking in astonishment. Sorry, said the sadhu with a twinkle in his eye. I didn't mean to break your rhythm. The young man recovered. I was just trying to think of something to say other than, You speak English! which seemed a little obvious. Forgive me for being so surprised. The sadhu shrugged. It is a common reaction. Some people seem to feel I would have more to teach them if I knew nothing of the world beyond these mountains. You are here because you choose to be, the young man replied. So am I. Who am I to judge? The mystic seemed amused, but not displeased. You have studied well to be so versed in the fine art of double-talk. You are an American? Canadian, came the reply. Ah, said the old man, looking at his guest with a hard squint, as if trying to tell the difference. You have traveled hard and far. I hope it was for a reason. It is said in many places that the sadhu of this valley knows much that is hidden or lost, that you understand the ancient secrets of the human mind the arts that we in the West might call hypnosis. The young man's eyes seemed to blaze. They say a great deal. Some of it happens to be true, came the reply. I wish to study, to learn what you know. The old man seemed genuinely amused by this. That is no small task, young one. I think perhaps you would not have patience for that. In time, as I come to learn your desires, I can shape your training accordingly. Then you will teach me. The young man said eagerly. You can pay? The old man raised an eyebrow. When his guest nodded, he continued. Forgive me if that seems crass. I think you will find I am not much of an orthodox sadhu. It is just possible that I was corrupted by the West. But that corruption also allows me to see the ancient techniques for what they are. A true science of the mind. He crossed to his young guest and extended a hand. What is your name, son? There was an instant of hesitation. There would be little point in lying to one to whom the secrets of the mind are an open book, the young man said. It is true, the sadhu smiled. But a secret is not a lie, the old man nodded. Sometimes a secret is the most true thing there is. Very well, then. For the moment I will call you two. The young man's brow furrowed. Why two? he asked. Because, the old man waved an arm towards the cootie, I already have one student. The man now called two looked up and saw that it was true. Another man, perhaps three or four years his senior, stood in the doorway, his face an impassive mask. His complexion was dark, his eyes predatory, but it was difficult to tell his ethnicity. Come meet your fellow initiate, the old man said. This is, my name is unimportant, the student said. The sadhu seemed surprised. It is, he said. The eyes of the two students locked. The elder spoke with a wry smile. Secrets are important, he said. When did this happen, the old man seemed frustrated. The pupil shrugged. Just now. The sadhu threw his hands in the air. Fine. 
Have it your way. One, meet two. Two, this is one. He pushed past them into the kuti. My name is Rashan, but you can call me Master. Have you ever wanted to find a place where kids can go to listen to funny stuff? Well, you have just found it. This podcast will have jokes, kids' stories, educational stuff that kids can learn from. So tune in and enjoy the show.